Okay, technically, a minute early, but I think everyone has been staring at me for the last three minutes anyway. So, <laughs> I didn't go ahead and get started. Um, I definitely want to keep this casual, so please, if you have questions throughout, feel free to just ask them. Um, don't feel like you need to wait for the end. You want to clarify, make a comment, definitely feel free. And also, I woke up with, of course, a bit of a scratchy voice this morning. So if there's something you need me to repeat, just go ahead and ask me. So today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my own personal experiences with science accessibility. It comes from a few different um, lenses and viewpoints of science, so I'm just going to go through and talk a little bit about my own experiences. So I thought it would be best to start off just by telling you a little bit about who I am and why I'm here talking to all of you. So I got my undergraduate degree in mechanical and biomedical engineering from Carnegie Mellon, and then kind of switched after graduation, realized that maybe engineering was not for me, and got into public health. I actually started um, working there as a research coordinator immediately after graduation from Carnegie Mellon, and now am almost done with my Master's of Public Health from the same school. I am also the founder of Accessible Universe, which is a disability and accessibility advocacy organization in Pittsburgh. It's still new and small, but we're having a big launch event um, in July to celebrate the ADA anniversary. And I am also currently Ms. Realtor USA where I've had the opportunity um, to really expand my advocacy reach, which has been exciting. I wrap up my reign later, mid-July, so coming to a close. <coughs> so my first um, experience with accessibility and sciences in a major way was with my undergraduate in engineering. But before I talk about engineering specifically, I think it's important to start with experiences with accessibility as an undergrad, because that's kind of, I don't know what that was. I don't know, okay. Um, I think that is the, the layer behind any specific major as or field of study as an undergrad is just life as an undergraduate. So going to way to college was my real first experience with independence in any real way, um, both in living alone and also handling the work that comes with getting accommodations for a disability. So it was the first time I had ever gotten hair from someone other than my parents. First time I'd ever lived. I hear it behind me. I don't know. Can you hear anything? Okay, I don't, I don't know what it is, sorry. Um, so that was a huge adjustment for me living alone and getting help from someone who I wasn't related to. And also managing that hair. What happens if you don't have a shift filled? What happens if an attendant isn't working out, isn't it a good fit? And so that's a huge adjustment and responsibility on top of the adjustment that comes with academics and college in general. Um, and it's also 
a learning experience in balancing your health and your newfound independence. So when are you getting sick enough that you need to worry? When do you need to choose sleep over maybe finishing a problem set? These are questions that, you know, for someone without a disability, without a chronic disease, getting two hours of sleep, not fun, but they'll live. For me, that might mean the difference between being healthy and letting it hold develop into pneumonia. And so those are real decisions that I think took a definite learning curve for me. Um, I was very lucky in that I think her Nadine Mellon had a good um, administrative support for disability services. They met with me before I ever began classes to kind of show me around campus and the dorms and explain to me accommodations that were available, how living in the dorms would work. And they answered questions that I didn't know I should ask because I had no, no idea what to ask at all. And I was very lucky in how flexible and willing to work with me the professors were because there were times that I did get pneumonia, I did get sick, and I'd have to miss maybe a few days of classes. One semester I missed all of my final exams because I just physically, I couldn't just choose to push through. That wasn't an option. And the professors were all very understanding and flexible and worked with me to find a solution that was convenient and safe for me. And I think that's, that was a huge, huge important thing um, for me to have. And I don't know what would have happened if my professors hadn't been so understanding and flexible. Um, but there were still lessons learned. You know, I spent, I, full honesty, spent a lot of my first few days at college crying because I didn't know how to adjust to training someone else to help me. And I did get sick, or I did spend too long in the computer lab finishing the assignment and come back to my room that, and find out that my aide had assumed I wasn't coming and left. And so those are things that, you know, they're added stressors that I don't think people always realize are in the background of my day-to-day -day life as an undergrad. Overall, very positive experience. I think Carnegie Mellon was very, very helpful to me. My sister went um, to Duquesne, which was a Catholic institution. They don't have to follow the Americans with Disabilities Act. And they were not nearly as easy to work with. Um, so I'm very grateful, but it was not always smooth. Looking specifically as an engineering student now, um, the accessibility tended to vary depending on the classes I was taking. I took mechanical engineering as one of my majors, which is a very hands-on project and building um, based set of classes. So some of them were more computer design, computer modeling, those were easy for me. I can use software, it was no issue. There was no accommodations I really needed for that. But for the more lab-based projects, it was a little trickier. So this isn't my picture, unfortunately, because I went to college before iPhones were really popular. So I don't have a lot of those day-to-day -day pictures of college life. But this is 
a picture of a project that we had to do, which was a mousetrap powered car. So you're given a mousetrap, maybe a few other little pieces of building material, and you have to, with a team, construct a vehicle, that, a little, little vehicle that's powered by that mousetrap. Now, a lot of the more physical parts of this project, I couldn't do. I can't go up to a machine in the lab and cut the wood. I didn't know what accommodations I could ask for. You know, it's hard when you've never taken a class like this before to really know how much help you're allowed to ask for and how much help is too much. So I didn't go to my professors. I tended to work it out with the team members of the project that I was on. I would have liked a professor to come to me and offer me some possible options, not force them, but say, hey, if you can't do this, let's talk about some ways that you might be able to participate. Here are some options that you have, but I don't think the professors knew what to offer me, and I did not feel comfortable enough going to them. I think often people assume that you're the expert on your disability, and I am, but I'm not the expert on engineering and being a college student. And so I think it's really important that there be a really open communication and that it not always be the student that has to initiate the conversations because they definitely did not feel confident enough to do that. Um, so nothing went poorly. I definitely did get my dad's help on some assignment. I was lucky that I lived close to home and he is a software engineer with an interest in building and fixing and helping, but I shouldn't have had to. And it would have been nice to know that ahead of time and not stress a few weeks before the project is due. And I don't feel like my teammates are really feeling the same pressure to get this done that I am. So I think it often comes back to flexibility being important. Offer options, open up that dialogue, but don't say, you can't do this, so here's what you need to do. It really is that open communication that is very important. So next is a little bit of a switch of topics um, because I switched from this from engineering to public health. And I don't think we often think about public health as a science necessarily. And we don't think of public health and accessibility fitting together, but I think they really fit together very well. Um, so I'm gonna start with a little background because before I started working and studying in public health, I had no idea what it was. So I kind of fell into it with the assumption that people have heard of it, but maybe don't really know exactly what public health means. So the American Public Health Association defines it as something that promotes and protects the health of people and the communities where they live, learn, work, and play. Super proud. Very, very proud. It basically, public health is focused on keeping people healthy and the way and the communities in which they live and work and play and stay healthy. 
it's really looking at the bigger picture of health of a society in general. <clears throat> so how does accessibility fit in? I'm going to start with um, the concept of upstreaming, which is really more of a medical concept right now, but I promise it will make sense. So it's based on a parable where three friends are walking by a river and they see children floating down this river. Two of the friends start going in, helping to carry the kids out of the river, keep them from drowning. But the third friend gets up and starts walking away and they say, hey, where are you going? And the friend says, well, I'm gonna go find out who's throwing the kids in the river. So instead of focusing on the symptoms, it's looking at the root cause of what is making this happen. So in medicine, this is something like, if someone comes in to a doctor's office with a cold, you don't just treat their cough and send them on their way. You talk to them, and maybe you find out that it's where they live. There's mold in their apartment, and that's causing them to get sick. So instead of just giving them medicine, you help them find resources so they can find a safe place to live. Again, it's that look at what is causing this, not what are the symptoms that I can treat right away. So in public health, we help things like this social determinants of health. And they're very popular right now because we're finding out that it has a huge impact on people's health long term. Where you live, where you work, your social and economic status, that has more of an impact on your health long term than a lot of the more clinical medical factors. So this is kind of where I see accessibility fitting in. We need to start thinking of accessibility in an upstream way, not a downstream way. We need to treat it from the beginning and make sure accessibility is included from the outset rather than putting on a ramp later after the building has already been built. So why does this matter from a public health perspective? Well, isolation is a really huge risk factor for health issues. I think it's pretty easy to see how a lack of access to your community can result in a really increased risk of isolation. But it's not just always physical access. Access is something that can take a lot of forms. It is true that partly it is physical. If there's no herb huts, if there's no ramps, if there's no elevators, you are going to be isolated. But it's often a lot trickier than that. What if you can get out of your house and you know that the building that you want to get to is accessible, but you don't have an easy way to get there? Or what if you have one way to get there, but you have to call for a ride 24 hours in advance? Are you always going to know when you want to leave and when you want to be picked up? Probably not. So you're not going to make the call. You're not going to have a way to get there and you're going to be set home. But if you don't have a well-paying job, then you don't have an income. You don't have a way to do things with the people that you want to do them with and you're going to be set at home. And this is something that sounds, I think, obvious, but often plays out in a very real way. You know, if I can only, if I have to either have a car or take a bus, and the rest of my friends are taking an Uber or Lyft to get where they want to go, what do I do? Do I go? Do I force them 
to ride the bus with me, even though the schedule might mean waiting 40 minutes for the next bus to come. And those are where we need to think on the larger community level, because it's easy for me to spell this out for me, one by one, I could give you many examples, but we need to start thinking of how we can make sure this access is built in from the beginning when we're thinking about transportation, when we're thinking about city planning, when we're thinking about policies. You know, right now, there's a huge um, movement to ban plastic straws. I can't drink without a straw. It's not possible. I can't hold my head back and tip the glass up. So then you hear, well, I should just bring a straw, bring a reusable straw. But I need to know how many straws a day I'm going to need, because I can't reach the sink in the bathroom and reach the soap to wash it out. And then I need somewhere I can carry all these straws. My strength is limited, my mobility is limited. There aren't that many places for them to go. And these policies are being enacted, and there's maybe an exemption for people with disabilities, maybe not. But even if there is, how many restaurants are going to carry plastic straws if they don't ever expect people to need them? How many restaurants are going to read the full policy and say, oh, I am allowed to have plastic straws for people with disabilities, but only if they ask for them. In reality, it plays out with restaurants don't stop the straws for anyone. And those are, we're making policies very quickly. We're not thinking about accessibility from the outset. We're maybe baking it in with an exemption that doesn't play out well in reality. And we're causing real issues that people don't think about. So I think we really, really need to slow down and make sure accessibility is included from the outset and not as an afterthought. And I think it's only to take some real systems level change and it's only to be hard, but I think it's really important. So that kind of brings me to my focus on advocacy and how important I think it is to really make sure accessibility is more on the forefront of people's minds. So this is kind of my favorite way of framing the issue, where often people know in some vague way about the Americans with Disabilities Act. But they think that the fact that the ADA exists, it's the old standard. It must mean that I have access, that everything is accessible to me now because there's a law that says so. But really, the ADA is a bare, it's often not followed, but even when it is, it's a bare minimum of inclusion. It says if I want to go to a restaurant, it's okay if the accessible entrance is down an alley around the corner and I have to walk through the kitchen to get to my table because it's accessible and I can get in. Now, I would love a private tour of a kitchen by a chef, but not so much when all I'm trying to do is meet my friends for dinner. That doesn't make me feel included, it doesn't make me feel valued, and it doesn't make me feel like you really want me there or you thought about me being there at all. So a few, uh, two years ago now, I was scrolling through Twitter, as I do a lot, and I saw a quote by the mayor of Pittsburgh that kind of has turned into his catchphrase now, which she said, if it's not for all, 
it's not for us. And he was talking about ride-sharing services, about Uber and Lyft, and about Uber testing out their autonomous vehicles in Pittsburgh. Well, <clears throat> Uber's not for me. There are a very, very, very select number of cities in which Uber is for me. But in the vast majority of them, I can't get an Uber, I can't haul a lift, and it doesn't seem like there was any thought when Uber and Lyft were developing that people with disabilities might actually want to use the service and might really value from it. I can't drive my own car. I have to get driven everywhere. So being able to call an Uber would give me a huge level of independence. It would allow me to go out with friends when I wanted without the logistical planning of many, many levels of detail that's required currently. But Uber developed, Lyft developed, took off, hugely popular, isn't accessible, and doesn't really seem to be a huge push for it to become accessible. They don't really seem very interested. Um, and it's not just in the article, I talked more than just Uber and Lyft. I had been at the uh, Pittsburgh Marathon the weekend before to watch my mom run the half marathon. And in addition to navigating the road closures for the marathon itself, we had an extra set of navigation backtracking because we get to the end of a sidewalk and find no curb cut. Even though this was the designated marathon detour, it wasn't the marathon detour for everyone. And I think this is true not only in Pittsburgh, but in a lot of cities. And why I thought, why I'm talking about this article is because after I wrote it, one of my professors from Carnegie Mellon sent me an email and said he had seen my article and it reminded him that as far as he knew, I had been his only student, it was a biology lab, his only student with a disability in all the years he had been teaching. And he was wondering why that was. It made him think about how had I been the only student. And that's why I think advocacy is so important, because that made my professor think about what was happening. It made him more aware. And I think it's important for high school students with disabilities who may not be told that college is an option for them to know that it is. I think it goes both ways. You need advocacy for people without disabilities to be more aware. And you need advocacy to let people with disabilities know what is possible. So looking in a bigger picture of why I think advocacy is so important, I think that accessibility is often siloed from the larger conversation. It's not treated as part of the overall process, but it's treated as the separate accessibility accommodations, the quote unquote special needs. We're having a huge conversation right now about diversity in general in society and disability often is included as part of that intersection. At colleges, you'll see offices of inclusion and diversity and offices of disability. I think disability is part of diversity. Those need to be one large conversation, not two separate ones. Accessibility needs shouldn't be siloed from anyone else's needs. They're just an additional set of needs that need to be considered. I think advocacy matters because people don't know if they've heard 
of the Americans with Disabilities Act. They don't really know what it means. They don't know that there's no enforcement for it. They don't know that the only way for a building to be accessible, if it isn't, is for me to call in a complaint to the Department of Justice and say, hey, this building isn't following the law. That's a huge imposition, an additional burden for someone with a disability. You know, we, so my sister is also in a wheelchair and will call restaurants all the time and say, hey, are you accessible? And they'll say, yes, there's just one step to get in. So they don't know. People don't know what accessible means. They don't really understand it. And we really need to keep having this on an conversation. Um, disability is often, is also really nuanced and individualized. What works for me might not work for someone else. You know, I remember learning um, that when her pets years ago were initially installed, they used to be smooth, like the rest of the sidewalks. But if you're using a cane and you can't see, you can't see where the sidewalk ends and the street begins. So now they use raised dots, that texture on her pets, so that someone using a cane can distinguish between sidewalk and street and someone with a wheelchair can get off the sidewalk. That's great. That's the ideal where we can take the different needs of different groups and come up with one solution that's better for everyone. But it only works if everyone is able to come to the table and tell you what your needs are. And if you're not feeling like you're invited, if you don't have a seat at the table, it's really hard to be able to get your voice heard and say, hey, this isn't working for me. So it's great when we can take all these different needs and come up with one better solution. But without advocacy continued, your just your voice is never going to be heard. Um, I think there's a lot of good conversations that happen around health care and education and housing for people with disabilities. But once you feel that like you've checked off those boxes, people tend to forget about the rest of your life. If I were to ask any of you what you like to do, you're probably in the list things that happen outside of your nine to five. But it's those things, concerts, restaurants, that don't get thought about with accessibility. And when you're thinking of inclusion, and when you're thinking of not being isolated, those are the things that matter the most. So I think it's kind of a new era of advocacy where you're breaking down the stigmas of people with disabilities and saying, hey, I have a disability, but I do still like to go out. I have friends. I have a job. I want to be able to do the same things that you do, but I can't right now, and here's why. So that's all from me. Um, I wanted to make sure to leave time for questions. I would love to hear thoughts, comments, questions, anything. In the red blazer shirt, sorry. Um, I <laughs> I don't 
know that I have a great answer for you. I think that I would be better at it now because I feel more confident in just being honest with people about what I can and can't do and what I need help with. If someone asked me how I wrote to do graduate school as a person with a disability, I would probably say something like, I'll figure it out. I don't know, but I'll make it work. Um, I think it comes down to how comfortable you are with acknowledging the help that you need. And I think I wasn't always that comfortable with it. And I didn't know. Um, so I don't know that I have a good answer other than it's a learning experience. And you kind of just have to figure it out as you go a lot of the time. I will say that as social media has grown, it's been very helpful in connecting me with people who have done this um, and asking them questions has been more helpful than anything else. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so I think asking, opening the dialogue is great. I think it's really important that you tell people we can do whatever you want. These are your options. Don't feel like you have to take any of them. But also kind of letting them know that these aren't extra special accommodations. These are accommodations to help you yet where everyone else already is. And I think also being really open with them and thinking openly about what accommodations might look like. Because I think often things that are considered perks, like a take-home exam or an exam at a different time. Let's say you have an 8 a.m. class and it's really challenging for you to get to an 8 a.m. class. For me, it takes three hours, basically, to get ready in the morning. It just is what it is. For someone who doesn't have a disability, they're rolling out of bed 10 minutes before their exam, going to class, taking it. Even on my easiest day, that is just not possible. So I think there's sometimes kind of a rote list of what accommodations are. And sometimes my requests don't fall into them. But it is, to me, an accommodation. Taking the exam at 11 isn't just because I want to sleep in. It's because I want to sleep the same amount that someone without a disability is sleeping. Um, so I didn't focus on the fact that these accommodations are just to get you where everyone else already is. It's really important. And I think under and being open to what accommodations might or might not look like is really important. One second, Josie. I'll answer in the blue shirt first. <laughs> Right. 
Oh, I don't know that I have a great answer for you. Um, I think that you're right, and I think it is often unfair. Um, I don't, I think that this is where it does come down to balance and taught in, sometimes I find that taught into professors one-on-one -on -one is more useful than taught into a larger disabilities resources office because the disability resources office might understand what you're putting into this, but on the individual level, the professor often doesn't. They don't know this underlying amount of work that you're putting in just to get to normal. So I would say if there's one, any one class in particular where the amount of extra work that you have to do is monumental, talk to the professor and say, hey, I want to talk to you because I want you to understand what I'm putting into this. Is there a way you can work with me to make sure that I'm still doing what I need to do, but I'm not doing so much extra just to get to where everyone else is. Um, and I think that is only something you can do if you feel pretty confident in advocating for yourself. Um, and I don't know if you do, but I will say that I think on the individual level, it's often sometimes better results than the overall university level where there are a lot of policies and procedures in place already. Does that help at all? Yeah, and that's, I, you know, kind of following up on that, I think that's something I've been doing since high school, honestly. I, I work a lot more with each individual okay. than I do with my disability center. And <laughs> even with all of that, you know, it, it feels like there's something that we should be able to do to even approach that further because I feel like I'm using every resource I have at my disposal. I talk, you know, you mentioned talking with other people. Um, so I network a lot on Facebook. You know, right. I think there probably is a gap, and it just hasn't been bridged yet because, because that divide exists between what you know you're doing and what you know your professors and the campus knows that you're doing, and your peers also. Um, I think my only other thing is sometimes you do have to take extra time for your own mental health and sanity. And you kind of have to accept that if it's going to take you an extra year to complete your degree, that's okay. And I think that's really easy for me to say and a lot harder to actually put into practice. So I know that sounds good and maybe isn't actually that helpful, but you would not be the first or the only to have to kind of more or less set it up and accept that this extra time will help you feel better overall. Josie, did you have a question? Sorry. So I think I have only had one job since I graduated college. I work in uh, research. I found academia to be fairly flexible. Maybe this is just my supervisor, so it's hard for me to say without a large amount of experience. Um, I think there are some things that could be more flexible. I don't have the ability to work from home right now, and that would be huge for me, um, but is not something my department currently allows or is set up to do. 
I think they're flexible in terms of hours. There's no arrive at 9 a.m. Um, and leave at this time. They're flexible in terms of me taking time off and going to doctor's appointments and things like that. But it's hard for me to say with only one job, especially since my supervisor now knows me pretty well. Um, hard for me to say if other positions would be as accommodating or not. I saw other hands earlier. They're all the way on my left in the red t-shirt. Okay. So this is more about Yes. You mentioned earlier about how the ADA Interesting. very weird choice to only braille one floor. I don't know how that is expected to help you. And those, it's things like that where I don't understand how no one stopped it before it happened and said, hey, this is a really basic, simple, easy to fix thing that you're not doing. And that's where I think People with disabilities have to be really loud and really annoying and keep being like, hey, you forgot about me, and hey, you forgot, you forgot. Because right now, people don't even know enough to know what they're forgetting. Yes, from earlier. Yes. <laughs> um, you. But it was um, that we also need to work kind of on making sure we're not accidentally making policies in universities that are meant to help mm -hmm. and they're actually hurting. Yes. Because one of the things I came across of is you said like, oh, it's better to work with an individual professor. And I found that a lot too myself. But then they started making the disability support services um, in order to make it so it's helpful in some situations because then you can work with work kind of help work around that one professor that inevitably is just like no right. not making it accessible for right. care. Um, but then it also creates a barrier because uh, some professors are told you have to run everything through the access office. And if the access office knows nothing about my field, right. um, then if the professor can't do anything themselves, you're kind of out of scale. Right. Too. Yep. I, I agree. And that's, I think it goes really well with the straw ban policies. Like, mm -hmm. don't jump into policies because you're putting down in words things that you have not really fully fleshed out and have not gotten opinions from everyone who needs to be heard from. If there was a great flexible policy in place, that had been, that had sought out the input from people with disabilities, that would be one thing. But quickly thrown to other policies that often are created to address one very small, specific issue are not the way to go. I think we're out of time. So thank you so very much. I'll be around for a few minutes if anyone has questions or comments up front. Thank you. <laughs>